All right, I think we're about ready. I want to welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Kristen Tollefson. I'm the Education Director here at the Bainbridge Island Museum of Art. And you are here for a Momentum Festival production. This is a, a really wordy, ti a wordily titled panel, um, Sparks and Catalysts. Uh, it's the social justice panel. Basically, you're here to hear <laughs> artists and our moderator talk about social justice and its connection to book arts. Without further delay, I'm going to hand the mic literally over to Jane Carlin. Well, thank you so much, and good evening, everyone. I'm delighted to facilitate tonight's panel and honored to be on this stage with four incredibly talented and inspiring artists. Just to give you a, uh, details of our format, I'm going to say a few introductory remarks and then each one of our artists will introduce themselves and their work. We'll open up for a conversation, share some questions, um, hopefully have feedback from you and we'll conclude the evening with each of our artists reading a piece um, from their work. So before we get started, I'd be remiss without acknowledging the museum for their support and of course the wonderful Cynthia Sears for her extraordinary efforts to promote book artists not only here on Bainbridge Island but across the nation. So I'd like to have a round of applause right now. It's really wonderful to have the museum and Cynthia here on Bainbridge Island, right here in the Pacific Northwest. And all the events and programs of the past month highlight that this is where it's happening. It's a destination for book artists. And of course, we're truly fortunate to be able to learn from Fred, Jeffrey, Ellen, and Carletta tonight. Now, all of us here know that books have always played a role in shaping society. From the moment Gutenberg's Bible was set to print, they have served to educate, inform, inspire, and incite. The enduring legacy of the book as a powerful vehicle for social transformation is just as significant today as it was over 500 years ago. Artists' books can serve as powerful catalysts for addressing social issues We've seen that upstairs, looking at books that deal with race, diversity, inclusion or exclusion, civil rights, health, economic disparity, the environment and consumption, and the list goes on and on. They also serve as a lens to rethink and reframe our historical narratives. The work of the four artists represented here tonight confront head-on difficult themes, and they ask the viewer to reflect upon often challenging and painful issues, to give us opportunities to increase dialogue, awareness, to call for justice, or provoke action. At the University of Puget Sound, where I'm the library director, we often use artist books and classes to introduce difficult topics to encourage our students to begin conversations that will foster mutual understanding and encourage them to reflect upon new perspectives. In a class for teacher education, we shared another, a number of books associated with topics that students and teachers often encounter in the classroom such as bullying, exclusion, and discrimination. Students were then assigned to create their own book. And I'd like to read a statement from a student who wrote a book about his own family's discriminatory practices in housing and how he came to realize after viewing the books that it was important to see his world through a different lens. He said, developing into an adult is a complex and dynamic process. Within this process is our socialization, often influenced by those we love and trust. But how often do we stop and analyze this socialization? How often do we consider our past 
in an attempt to better understand our present and create a better future. My artist book is an attempt at this reflective process. This type of comment is not unusual. Often after sessions of working with students and artist books, they tell me this book gave a voice to someone forgotten, someone passed over. This book helped me personally deal with a difficult issue. This book helped me confront an issue that I didn't really even want to think about. This book helped me understand something from a different point of view. And perhaps most impactful, I saw myself in this book. As a librarian, I know how important artist books are to build a collection of diverse materials that help share and show new narratives and new voices. So simply put, I would say artist books are a catalyst for social change. On our panel tonight, we'll explore this potential of this intimate art form to wrangle with critical and often poignant human issues. Now, can artist books save the world? Maybe not, but I think we can try. One book and one artist at a time. So, let's get started. Fred. My first books were a um, public works project where I did, uh, with the help of a student, one who's here in the back row, uh, I did uh, editions of 100 and then about issues that I thought were relevant to high school students and then sent them off free to high, schools, high school libraries. From there I started working on poetry uh, and working with poets and then after that uh, began uh, working on historical subjects. The subjects that I worked on include uh, the Japanese American incarceration, the effects of nuclear testing in the Marshall Islands, the experience of World War I nurses, uh, the documents of the, Africa, of the Atlantic slave trade, uh, the experiences of a friend of mine who was a news photographer in Iraq. There we go. Um, uh, the experience of the Dakota in Minnesota during their uprising and their removal from the state, and the family story of a friend of mine, uh, a Maori family from New Zealand and the uh, Maori Battalion. Um, altogether, history is full of a lot of sad stories. One curator called these my bummer books. Uh, my books start with text or story. I try to make them deliver a significant story in a reading that takes only 10 minutes. I like working within that sort of restrictive format, trying to distill things down to a hopefully powerful story within that time. Uh, maybe I'm influenced by the golden books that we had when we were kids. Um, my books don't make much sense unless they're read, um, and that's a bit of a challenge in the world of book arts. I, I tend to work in fairly traditional formats. I look upstairs, I see all these sculptural forms, very different from what I do. And then finally, as a printmaker, I was influenced by Mauricio Lasansky, who one of the things that he did was a series of very powerful drawings on the, of the Holocaust. He has a statement that really struck me. He said that you can't um, take away someone's dignity. But if you try, you take away your own. I've always felt that that's very profound, and it's something that I've tried to perpetuate in my books. I try to find the stories of people that have a tremendous sense of dignity, even though they've lived through mistreatment. That's one of the ones from the African uh, slave trade documents. Oops, went fast. And this is one of the books about uh, the Marshall Islands. I think that's it. Here you go. Okay. Hi. I'm Ellen Knudsen. I run Crooked Letter Press. I am Crooked Letter Press. I live in Gainesville, Florida. Um, I, a lot of my artist books do deal with social justice issues, but I don't set out to do that. I just, my, a lot of my work stems from anger and frustration with whatever I come you know, across that get, makes me feel that way, and then that's what I do my work about. Um, so this book is in the collection here. It's called American Breeding Standards. This is a book about um, 
body issues that really I've dealt with as a woman my entire life. Um, and it's a book that the text is um, American horse breeding standards, but anywhere the text says horse, it, there's a blank. No, it doesn't say woman, but you can fill it in with whatever you want, and it fits woman. Um, and there, this book has a little pop-up mouth because I was interested in the idea of taking the body apart, editing the body down to nothing, looking inside the body. So the book starts with this open mouth, pop-up map. This is another um, fold-out page from the book that is stomachs and all of the editing that happens with stomachs, all of the different surgeries you can have to reduce your stomach. Um, this is a book about Florida and the springs, the freshwater springs in Florida. I didn't, I lived, I live in Florida, I've lived there for 10 years. When I moved there, I didn't realize there was anything but ocean on the edges, but there are freshwater springs that are beautiful prehistoric things that people don't know about. Uh, they're very, very beautiful, but they are disappearing. They are getting dried up and the water table in Florida is not, it, you know, it's getting poisoned. And the red tides that people have heard about have gotten worse and worse over time. So this is a one of a kind tunnel book. Um, this is kind of uh, reflecting back to when I first started being a book artist, I would make books like this. I would make them with stencils and rub on type and I would just make one. And so this is another one like that. This is another view of that and you can see the rub on type down the side. This book is called Wild Girls Redux. This is a revisit of a book, the first real letterpress printed book that I, artist book I ever did at Columbia College in Chicago when I first learned how to letterpress print. But I did another version of that book called Wild Girls Redux. And the text from this book, I write a lot of my text, but I also use text that I find. This is um, motorcycle road rules as applied to the female body. Again, I'm interested in how women's bodies have been um, disassembled and restricted and edited and controlled. So that's what the text of that book is about. So here's a list of some of those rules as you ride this motorcycle or person. And this book is in the exhibition upstairs. This is called Intrusion. And this is a book about the in human intrusion on the environment. And um, a lot of the text is taken from articles off of the internet. They're all cited. And the author is given credit for them. But then woven through the book is also my comments um, on the woodcut page. You can see comments by me. And then in the back of the book, it's, a, it's printed on Okawara paper. You can see through to the other side. There's a poem that my son wrote about the environment that he just happened to have written at the time when I was doing this book, so I used that text on the back of the book. And this is sort of a, over, it, it's a long book, it's a long accordion. So like I said, I mean, I do work about social justice, I get issues, but it's not like I'm going down a checklist of, oh, this is the social justice thing, I just happen to do it. And I actually think a lot of book artists do work about social justice, that's just what we're worried about today. And always, maybe. So. so I'm Jeff Morin. I'm the uh, founder of Sailor Boy Press, which I started in 1983. And I want to preface this by, by probably characterizing all of us. We're very happy and joyful people. But what you're going to see is a litany of these crises, one after another, that weave themselves into our work. For myself, I would describe myself as, uh, as a an omnivore maker. So I am a book artist, but I'm also a painter and a printmaker. So in the examples of the work that I'm going to show, you're going to see a fair amount of that. If you see it, there we go. Um, so the first example here is an edition book. I work, when I work in book arts, I work as a letterpress mm -hmm. book artist, traditional printer. I work typically with handmade papers. And I have a format that I go to often to deal with some of these serious topics. In this case, when Rudolf Brashda died in 2011, he had only revealed very late in his life 
that he had survived Buchenwald concentration camp during World War II. Most people didn't know this about him for most of his life. And the reason why he was in Buchenwald was that he was a detainee because he was gay. And he was identified as such in, in society. He kept this secret after he survived Buchenwald uh, for a large part of his life. This started out as a book on very pretty pink paper. And as I worked on the paper, I hand dyed or hand dipped the paper so that it all felt very sooty and ashen. I wanted it to have that, that dry texture, but also something that when you picked it up, you felt like you had to wash your hands after it. That seemed to make sense for me for the narrative. So oftentimes a book will lead to another type of project. So this is a broadside I did about uh, just, just an homage to Brajda and as a one-sided poster of sorts, still letterpress printed and, and relief printed, um, I just layered signature upon signature so that it took on the sense of an official document. Because so much that we see about um, you know, Germany in that time period was very codified, very systematized, very official and, and um, authority oriented. So I wanted this record of his life to reflect that. Uh, oh, I'll go back for a second. Um, in this case, this is one of my paintings. This is an oil on panel, very traditional approach to oil painting. And it is from a series called Sainted in Orlando. So after the Pulse nightclub shooting in Orlando, what I wanted to do was figure out, figure out a way to produce um, an object or a series of objects that um, commemor commemorated, honored, identified that moment so it didn't disappear. That, that's where I see my work. If it, if it has any longevity to it, it finds a way of sitting in, in history. It, it's, it's a part of a contemporary conversation about what's going on. Most of that tends to fall into the social justice realm, um, but, it, but it's typical of things that are, that are in the media in the moment. So it's, uh, it, it reflects my background. I grew up in a very, um, very conservative, dogmatic Catholic uh, community in Northern Maine, French Catholic community. That probably affected my work and the church more than anything. It's in, it's in the format of what I do. It's in the themes that I choose. Um, another series that I did very recently, this was a series of monoprints done for um, a printmaking collective that happened at the Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design where I work. And um, it was to pull mono printers from around the world to, to work for a week with students. And I was thinking I was gonna do a whole series of different looking work. And what I ended up by doing was repeating one image over and over again, trying to work with the nature of, of a, what a tattooed figure looks like. And, and I just picked this particular word and it, it makes sense with the rest of my work, but in and of itself, it was simply a tattoo that one might have on their body. Uh, another uh, project that was done very recently, this was done as a portfolio of artists um, after the Parkland shooting. And what we did is pull together a series of, of um, uh, broadsides, or again, like posters in, in a portfolio uh, to speak to that event, to make sure that event was recorded in history and in the case of um, this broadside, it's just a list of what was said in the media to explain the, Park, the Parkland shooting. Um, it's abortions and the lack of religion. It's Ritalin, Ritalin and violent games, um, political correctness, uh, and, and the list goes on and on. And these are actually headlines pulled from the, from the media to explain this particular shooting. Um, and in the, the last book that I produced, um, this book is titled A Murder of Crows or The Defense of Marriage and Other Things. And it is a fable about um, marriage equity. So that's in effect the body of my work, why I happily find myself in the company of these other artists. And that's how I connect to social justice in my work. Good evening. I'm Carletta Carrington Wilson, and uh, I prepared uh, a text. I'm going to read from the text and then make some comments. I sat with a tape recorder in hand, 
plying my grandmother with questions. It was summer. We weren't alone. With us was the whirring fan, children's voices rising in waves outside her windows, doors slamming, cars humming as they passed by. I was at that stage of life where a person awakens to the realization that there are things you've never discovered about someone you've known your entire life. Distance and death delivered me to that day where I sat in fervent anticipation. My grandmother was born in 1899. Orphaned at six months, she was raised by her grandparents a gardener, and a washerwoman. Months later, it dawns on me that my grandmother's grandparents had to have begun their lives enslaved. Until that moment, I could not recall any mention, recognition, or acknowledgement from her or anyone else of any enslaved ancestor. Why was that? In order to know, I had to go down the road a bit, take a circuitous path. Mind you, I'm still on that road. Decades of travel, so to speak, have given me the tools that make it possible to construct works birthed, birthed out of those conversations. For instance, I learned that the system of enslavement in the United States was modeled on that of Rome. How fortuitous to have the opportunity to respond to the work of Heliodorus, whose ancient Greek novel, Ethiopica, an Ethiopian romance, features the enslaved woman, Thisbe. That name I have shorn was commissioned for the exhibit Just One Look, held in conjunction with a conference sponsored by UW's Classics Department. What is unique about this beat is that she leaves a letter on a wax tablet to explain her side of the story. Even though it is a fictional voice, it is perhaps, singularly, the earliest voice from a void of silenced voices. I took an eight-week encaustic class, had eight weeks to figure out how to portray this woman's story in wax. In the poem, which is embedded in that piece, that name I have shorn, Thisbe rails against her merchant captors. For the series Book of the Bound, I discover in Elizabeth Donnan's documents illustrative of the history of the slave trade, names of ships transporting enslaved Africans. Some are highly evocative names. Merchant Love is the name of a slave ship. This accordion book reveals ships named for women. Pink Mary, words of passion, true love, and adoration, amaretta. Book of the Bound is a series that exemplifies the silence and silencing of the enslaved. Each book is encased in cloth, visually representing the role textiles have played in the trans transatlantic trade in slaves. Enslavement is a form of imprisonment. In the Brazilian film, Caran Biru, a riot takes place. By its end, a number of prisoners are massacred by mil military police. This work, who are you to riot in Caran Biru, is the only real book that I have been able to complete to date. Now, this book came about because I had seen the film, Karandi Diru, 
as we were exiting the film, a man in front of me commented to his friend, they shouldn't have rioted. Georgie, but Georgie and Biddy's quarters, the work takes a turn. It begins to simplify. I am ready to explore the plantation landscape, a landscape of stark contrasts. In this case, a wordless book in the form of a structure meant to house a labor force that can neither read nor write. Thank you. As the facilitator, I'm not sure I can respond in uh, uh, injustice to all your comments. So thank you very much for your um, introductions. Um, many of you mentioned historical themes in your work, and I know that uh, doing research has played a huge part in the creation of many of your books. And I'm really struck and inspired by your ability to bring new meaning to historical documents and current events, and how you transform them to inspire and engage the viewer. Can you share some experiences about the process of discovery and research, and how you began to piece together a theme or in one of your books? Are we doing any order here? Any order. I'll give a shot. <laughs> For me, it started with one particular book, and it's called Deeply Honored. And there's a story that's connected to my college about a student that came, <clears throat> excuse me, came to college from an internment camp. And I read the file. First, there was a room dedicated to him, and then I read the file. And I don't think anybody could get through that file without crying. And it's all these letters that document the life. And what I wanted to do was make those people come back to life. Especially in a way, the soldier's mother. Because she was so generous. Generous to the school, and just generous to the country, given what they've gone through. And so I live on a campus, and there's all these plaques. But nobody knows the story behind those plaques. And so I found this one story that really moved me and I wanted to make that come to life for other people and, and to sort of do it justice. Well, I don't do research in that way that maybe um, it's historical. I, I would say the stuff that I do is more about things that I turn over in my mind and it's almost as though I can't escape them. I mean, I think we all sort of feel that way with the news and. Instagram and Twitter and all those things that we see and so intrusion in particular is what I'm thinking about because that text is from the internet and it's about the environment but it's not as though we don't know this we, we can see it with our own eyes in the, in the places that we live that the environment has changed um, and so really what I'm doing is I, I feel like I'm, I'm representing myself with, with what I'm doing but I also know that other people are going to relate to that and that's really the goal um, ultimately, like when I finish a book, it's not mine anymore, it's for other people, but it's coming through my head and translating. And I'm also interested in rules, so a lot of my books focus on rules. I actually don't like rules, but I understand we have to have them. And so sometimes I'll invent rules, like with the Wild Girls book, um, I'll make up rules that are real or not real. <laughs> And um, so, so I don't do like historical books in that way, but I sort of talk about current events like that. In a series of books, three book trilogy that I did with the book artist Karen Heft, we did a series of Ars Moriendi, or books about how a society faces death. In Karen's case, she worked on a story about the first female Palestinian suicide bomber. And in our joint book, we studied uh, mercury poisoning in Wisconsin. Uh, but for the book that, that I was uh, challenged with, uh, a lot of my work deals with AIDS and, and the impact of AIDS on, on society, in, including the book that, that's upstairs in the show. In this particular book, it was about uh, AIDS in Africa. And one of the folk cures is to have sex with a virgin. To purify, the man can purify his body. 
The thing is, how do you know the person's a virgin? So the um, victims get younger and younger and younger to the point where the book that I wrote, Svangale and the Murderous Rooster, is, um, uh, involves a six-year-old girl by the name of Svangale. And what I tried to do is think about how she processed anything about what was going on. So again, I connected it to a folk story that she would have been familiar with. And this is a true story. It came, came out of the media. And um, so my assumption is that she just lived through this fairy tale as she was experiencing this, this horrifying assault by a family friend. Um, so in a process like that, it takes a lot of research about something from a culture that isn't one's own, but to try to figure out if there is an authentic piece that can help um, make sense of a narrative that doesn't make sense. So that, that's where research sometimes happens in the work that I do. Uh, for, for that name I have shorn, before I took that eight week encaustic class, I had to do a lot of reading about um, slavery um, in Rome, and particularly uh, I sought images. So in addition to reading Heliodorus's text, I looked at images of uh, Grecian um, urns, and actually there's a series called um, um, Black, or just the, the black in Western art. And uh, very early, I stood looking at this book. There are these sort of urns. They're, sometimes they have two heads, one on either side. But I found that they had these African faces. That's where I got the face of the image of Thisbe from. And so there was a considerable amount of time in which I, which is what I call hunting. Um, I start always with uh, a, a title, and then the title um, leads me towards what I call the form, what the form is going to take. And so certainly I knew that I was going to have a poem because Sisby was literate, and uh, most enslaved people, particularly the, in the United States, most were illiterate. So she was unique right away with that. Um, I was going to work my general textile collage for when I discovered that she had written on a wax tablet. Then I went hunting for images of wax tablets. Then I couldn't just collage. I had to embed this poem in wax, which got me to the encaustic class, which um, was a way to try to at least aesthetically give the sense that it was from the time. Thanks, everyone. I think Cynthia mentioned in the curator's statement that artist books are one of the most well-researched mediums, and you've all reflected that in your comments. Um, Fred, you said that you try to tell stories to come alive and um, Jeff, you talked about making stories, uh, telling stories that haven't been told again. What is it about the book medium that uh, draws you to um, tell these stories? Why, why books? Uh, many of you come from different artistic backgrounds and traditions. What is it about the artist book that really speaks to you in terms of a format? I try to do work about social issues in a single format. I admire Katja Kollwitz, who can come up with a single image that just says it all. When I try to do that, I come up with a cliche. When I tried to do it in book format, I felt that I, it had a rhythm to it, that I could take sort of secondary issues and points, that I could use image together with text, and that, that I could use that flow of the book, and it helped me to expand quite a bit. And then beyond that, sometimes people say, well, why don't you just put this on the internet? You know, that, then, you, then you get a lot more exposure. Um, I have two reasons for that. One, I really value the experience of being in special collections and having the thing right there. I just think it's an amazing privilege, and too many people don't realize that you can have that experience. 
That's one. And then the other is, is I, that's my skill set. You know, I, 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 uh, getting outside of my skill set is a little scary. <laughs> Uh, for me, the book um, is approachable, and we all know what that is. We recognize it, um, and I, I know that all books don't look like a book, like a codex, um, but I think that's what I like about it, and I, I actually can't help it. I dream in books. I, I think about everything that I want to do as an artist in the book form. I don't always know what that form is going to be. But I like the container. I like that you, I mean, your comment about the timing, I'm really interested in that idea, that you want it to be experienced in a certain time limit. I, I like that a lot. I've never thought about that. I don't know that I've been conscious of it, but I appreciate that a lot. Um, but I, I also, you know, I was saying earlier about uh, that I have rules, but I've also started to look back at what I've done over the years and realize I've sort of made dictionaries they're visual dictionaries. And I think it's that container and have it, I want answers. I know I'm not solving it, but I want answers for myself and I think that the book does that, that book form. I mean, for me, I would look to all of you and, and now be honest mm -hmm. and raise your hand. How many of you have ever smelled a book? <laughs> Isn't that isn't that incredible? I mean, those in the front who can't see, I mean, almost everyone raised their hand. There's something so universal about a book, and you, you admitted something that almost feels naughty. You know, like you, you, you smell this old book, or my husband and I joke about this all the time, you know, a book that has just been printed. There's something that we were both in publishing at one point. The smell of new ink is like the smell of a new car. We should all share that experience without having been taught that. Mm -hmm. And I think that people who come to a, to a book for some appreciation will not always be the same people who come to a painting or a print. Mm -hmm. But you all confess to this little naughty secret that we share. And that's the thing that I find appealing. And this was, this was, I've never done that before in a, in a discussion, but I, I always <laughs> assumed that other people were doing this. <laughs> Well, my identity first was as a poet and a writer. And so I was already wedded to the book form. Um, I also create collages and now installations. But I have always been deeply wedded to the form of the book. Once I started the work around slavery and enslavement, then came the realization that it was illegal. It was against the law for someone like me to know how to read or to write. And actually, as I talked about silence, <laughs> this idea, if you think the history of the book, and actually, there's written language on the African continent. But I'm thinking about the people here, hundreds of years in which something that is so essential to us today was forbidden. You know, the legacy of that still reverberates. And so when I encounter the book form, text and image are bound together. And I am still trying to work something out. I can't really tell you what it is. But something about this circumstance, that's why Thisbe was so important when I discovered that she had written this letter. Because there are so many people whose stories will never be known. Because the one enduring thing about a book especially if it's mass produced, is somebody's gonna find it and read it. Thank you. And um, on a more upbeat note, I have um, just saw a candle that was 
named for book scent. So that smelling of the book, that tactile feeling. And I can say as a, a, a library director that students really do have that appreciation of going into the special collections and having that intimate experience with handling a book and really having that opportunity to reflect and think. So I'm so glad that all of you are working in book format. So glad you're dreaming of books, Ellen. Um, I have a question that might come up, be a little bit more difficult, but how does your creative work come easily or do you struggle with your ideas? Um, for example, I was reading on Ellen's blog that you um, often refer to a quote that's uh, from Oscar Wilde, um, what good is art and why do it? Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so what obstacles, if any, do you experience when you're creating? Um, what? Hello? Mm -hmm. um, what obstacles? do you experience when you hit a, a roadblock? How do you move forward in the creative process? What do you do to help move your project forward? Maybe. Start on this side. Well, um, I always start with this phrase, Book of the Bound, that name I have shorn. I mean, I can't start without that. Once I have that, phrase or what actually just bubbles up comes that I'm always writing them down. And then I just start to chew on them again and again and I try to think about, okay, so what, what form? What's the form? So let's say Book of the Bound. Okay, so I think about, all right, well obviously I'm going to hunt down books. But as I started, you know, going to Goodwill, half price books, all these places, uh, mostly it was just Goodwill and half price books. And um, I would look for, um, how can I say, it's uh, something that evoked a response. Then I bring it home and it tells me how it needs to be expressed is the best way I can say. So I have a, a, a piece called Abduction, which is um, on the exterior, it's, it's coverless, it has um, bones attached by lace that looks like lace chains, and it is to commemorate the people who were abducted from deep in the interior and they never made it onto those ships, or they never made it to what we know as the United States. So it commemorates the people who were lost in the passage. So that's how I work, and it's, it's a process of layering and, and actually uncovering uh, the intent of the form. Because I have an additional day job, one of the, probably one of the most frustrating things is not with developing the narrative or building the artwork. And this is particularly true in, in book work. Um, if one's working on a painting, it's in, in, it's in front of you on the easel and you can come back to it, and you, you'll sort of remember where you are. In a book where you've done one step 50 times for 50 pages and then another step and it might take a year or two years, which used to be about the time frame for me to complete a book project. If I was away from the project for too long, I would forget what I was doing. And I know that that sounds so simple and simplistic, but I, I'm really formula driven and structurally driven in my work. And coming back to a piece after a gap of time and to forget what you were doing, it's unsettling. And it's caused me to scoop up projects and start all over again because I just can't find the thread. And that's probably more than anything, that is probably the, the most frustrating challenge I have in my work. It's not the narrative, it's not the story. Those will come eventually and they take however much time they take. But it's forgetting where, where I was. I mean, I sort of have a similar experience where, I mean, when I'm starting a book, I'll say, I can't get a hold of this book. I, it, like, it's slippery, and I can't 
quite form what it's going to be. So when I run into that, which I do, because again, I have a, a job at University of Florida and teach there, and, and I uh, curate the book arts collection and special collections at University of Florida too. So I don't have time. I don't have as much time as I would like um, to get work done. I will, but what I will do is draw. I, I, I keep a notebook where I draw the, the book. Sometimes I'll even draw what the finished book is gonna look like before I even really got content. I'll start to imagine the finished object. Um, but I make mock-ups. I make little folded pieces. That helps me a lot if I feel like I'm losing the thread of of what the book is going to be about. But I've had that experience where I don't remember what I was what I was building. Yeah. For me the hold up is what's the next story. Mm -hmm. And I know there's a lot of them out there, but you're gonna put a lot of time into a story and so you, you want it to really mean something to you. I think the stories I find are either about some horrendous thing that someone has done or else some amazing thing that someone has done. Um, so as an example, um, when I read that the early atomic energy people decided to send the Marshall Islanders back to an island because it was contaminated and they wanted to see what was going to happen to those people, and then I read a, a, a statement by a woman describing the birth defects of her child that only lasted a few minutes after birth, that's a book. You know, it's just obvious. Or if I read about, if I know about someone that persevered in, in some situation like that, those people stand out to me. But for me, it's just like, well, where's, what's the next story? What's, what's worth it? Oh, and then I'll also say, I'm, I'm at best a so-so binder. <laughs> yeah. I'd say a bit better than so-so. <laughs> I'd like to give you, the audience, a chance to ask our artists questions. Um, are there members of the group here that would like to um, Which can? Sorry. have a question? And I think if you could stand and perhaps, um, since we don't have a mic on the floor, just if bellow. you could bellow. bellow. If you could bellow. <laughs> I want to go back a little bit because you guys used some different terms of, I can't remember what they were, not block printing, but certain types of printing that you do, and then the wax printing. Could you just talk a little bit about some of the techniques that you guys use? Because I wasn't familiar with them. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, a number of my books have been done on silkscreen. Silkscreen is not my favorite printmaking medium, but it, it uh, adapts well to uh, uh, photographic sources, so it works with archival things. That's basically making a stencil and smearing ink through it. Um, but my primary training is in relief, which is where you carve and then print from the remaining surface, or intaglio, which is like etching. Um, and uh, one of the challenges is kind of putting all that together and keeping it clean. And um, yeah. Yeah, most of my work is. I mean, I have one-of-a-kind books where I have used stencils and pochoir, which is a stenciling technique, and, and rub on tight. But most of my books are letterpress printed. Um, yeah, letterpress printed. So it's a relief printing process. Um, my, my press is a Universal One Vandercook printing press, which is a proofing press that was used before offset printing. That's how <coughs> everything was printed. Um, so yeah, I, I print everything relief and in addition, so most of my books are done in additions of 35 to 100, it depends on what I'm working on. But sometimes I'll do wood cuts, that I, but I do letterpress print them, so I have to make that thing, whatever I'm gonna print has to be type high, and I print metal type, wood type, lino cut, but the block has to be type high to put it into the press, and it gets inked on the surface and printed. That's what a letterpress is. Yes. So, so we work with similar device, and, and you put about six of us in a room, and someone says Vander Cook, and oh, you've got one of those, you know, I've, I've got an SP15, and someone else has a four. These were all the proofing presses at print shops in the 30s and 40s and 50s before offset printing was as popular. They were called proof presses because they would pull one proof 
photo mechanically reproduce that and move it onto a bigger high speed press. So letterpress printing is lead type or wood type. Most of us are working with hand crank presses. Some of our type comes from the 1800s, 1900s. Some is being cast today. Um, in that respect, you know, I'm a very traditional printer because um, the text is always letterpress printed. And that's not true for all book artists. Uh, in my Crow book, it was the images were silk screened from original drawings. So the same printing technique that we make T-shirts with. Uh, is what some of that imagery would be. And, and probably a unique thing for me, uh, comp compared to the other members here, I hand dye a lot of paper. So it looks like we're taking in laundry sometimes because we will be dipping you know, hundreds of sheets of paper in dye or in um, indigo, the same indigo dye for fabric, and dry it on a laundry line uh, until the color sets. Um, and that, that just becomes part of the process. That makes each sheet a little more organic or different, one sheet to the next. And it almost becomes part of the imagery, just in a, in a process part. So, um, for the wax tablets, um, I found, and you can go online and you can see these. So they were, they look basically like a little slate. And this is how letters were written then. And they were written in wax, and then they would warm the wax over, and of course, the text would disappear. So of course, I wasn't going to be able to do that. Um, I spent a lot of time looking for something that was approximate to that idea. And I finally came um, upon um, something that uh, it was like a box that I open up. And inside, of course, the panels have to be wood to take the heat. And so basically encaustic is painting in wax. And some of the earliest uh, wax paintings of portraits from um, Roman citizens are still in existence. Um, they harden to a surface that's really, you can, you can still find them. You can see images online in some libraries. I tried to see if there was a library uh, locally that owned one so I could go and view it, but I couldn't. So basically, um, I had to have everything ready so that when I took that class, basically I was trying to work through how I was going to get that text embedded. And basically, I um, printed it out copied it, and there's a way that you can um, use, a, I think it's acetate. It'll make the, the paper disappear so it appears as though um, the text is just floating in that. And I was sort of, you know, successful for that. <laughs> but anyway, uh, it's a very interesting process, and a caustic uh, takes some time to sort of learn how to um, basically paint the wax so it is smooth and not sort of lumpy. That makes sense to you. Thank you. And I, I can just imagine the clothesline of all the, the dyed paper. <laughs> Visually, it's <laughs> in my mind. Um, there was, a, I think, another question in the back. Um, I was hoping that maybe y'all could share um, what it's like to navigate tension, for the lack of a better word, between being an artist and using your mediums and some of the emotional labor that goes behind social justice work. Mm -hmm. I'll start with that one. That's why I prefaced during the introduction that we're all wonderful, happy people and relatively sound of mind. Uh, because we go through the litany of the content in our work and uh, it can feel really exhausting. And, and having sat on a couple of other panels where we start these conversations, it gets, it gets really heady really quick. And probably the thing that I keep in mind is that what most of us are, I mean, it seems like what most of us are working from are true stories. Mm -hmm. And in a weird way, 
that should make it worse, but in a weird way that also keeps me working and connected to the narratives and, and constantly looking for those narratives because they are true. They did happen. And in some cases, we'll never know what the stories were because they never got recorded. So what happens if we don't record them? We're, we become guilty or culpable or um, a sinner in a way for, for not recording this important story. Like you mentioned, Brad, some of, the, some of the stories that you find, it's like, that's a book. The minute you hear the story, that's a book. And, and then we become compelled. Yeah, you know, um, people have said to me, you know, I, I have for literally decades have been reading slave narratives. Um, and people say, well, how could you, or well, why do you want to go back there? Mm -hmm. One of my responses is, well, we haven't left. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other is, I said, the least I could do is to know. I said, every day I can get up and I can make many decisions about how I'm going to spend my day. But there are people still today who wake up and do not have that luxury. So um, actually, there is something that is, I don't want to say satisfying, but it, there is a satisfaction in feeling that I am not trying to escape history, but that I am trying to understand how our lives have been shaped and are continually being shaped by decisions that people are making about who belongs and who doesn't belong, about who's entitled, who's not entitled. And so it, it is not distressing to me um, because I can always do something else, but there are people mm -hmm. for whom that's not possible. Mm -hmm. So the least I could do is to be aware. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, I, I'm glad I have the books to make to get through the tension. That actually helps believe it. I don't know what, I, it, I wouldn't be a happy person if I couldn't get it out. And I, I feel a responsibility to the truth. I'm interested in things that have been lies, and I want to talk about what's true and what I see is true. And so I think I'm reveal. I'm hoping to reveal that. That's what I want to put out there. And so that's what I think my books do. So it actually relieves tension to make that work. In Carletta's piece upstairs, I think she makes some people come alive again, mm -hmm. and I've tried to do that in a different way. Mm -hmm. And I will say that's satisfying. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, compared to the sort of loud, ugly voice of today, I find it uh, much more satisfying to go back and try and find people who deserve to be brought forward. I'd just like to comment from my perspective as a library director and um, re-emphasize how grateful and thankful I am for artists like you that are allowing us in universities to begin to build collections that tell those stories that haven't been told and haven't been collected. And it's really, really important work, particularly for this generation of students. So thank you so much. Are there other questions from the audience? Go ahead, thank you. Um, you know, that all of these subjects you know, as, as everybody up there has said, you, know, you kind of need to go through the book to rediscover, really you know, what you're you're trying to communicate. Um, from from the museum's perspective, how, you know, if, if you could talk about ways we can make the display more effective, you know, get get your point out there more clearly. It, that's a great question, and can I follow up a little bit about? On that because on my list I, I had um, a question about who do you see as the audience for your books but also how can we help you get that message out we're so fortunate to have this wonderful museum in the Pacific Northwest but how can we help you as artists get your work and your messages out 
Five books? <laughs> well, I mean, you're talking to people who are just invited to this institution, treated very well, so, I mean, <laughs> that, that helps. Uh, <laughs> um, but I think one of the issues is how to display. And um, so upstairs with my books, there's uh, a frustrating thing where just two pages are there and only part of the story. And, I, and then the museum is attempting in its own way to have pages turned electronically. That's one way that is intriguing. I've, I've experimented with that in some of the shows that I've done. And the thing that's in the back of my mind is it takes a lot of time to do a book. So the Bravo book, I counted up, it was 3,500 press runs. You know? So that took a lot of time. That's why it smells the way it smells. <laughs> uh, um, but I'm starting to think about copies that are okay to handle. You know, like, okay, have one for the case, and then maybe one that's okay, let it get beat up. And uh, maybe that changes distribution a little bit. Maybe that changes cost a little bit. I, I don't know. I've been thought that through, but that's intriguing to me. Yeah. I mean, I would suggest bringing students, bringing groups to look at the books if you can. If you're somehow able to do that, that's great because um, that experience of the the full book, like you say, the limitation of a gallery in some ways is you know. It's frustrating for the artist, like you can't see the whole book, and that's really not really what it's for necessarily. Um, so yeah, if you can bring groups that can, and, and I'm as an artist, I make books that, and I want people to touch them, and I don't know how they're going to end up if they're going to get dirty or whatever. But I'm okay with it. I want them to be read. I want to say one thing quick. Yep. The thing that you read by your student, I would trade that for um, more broad distribution. You know, just the thing of one kid really getting it like that is worth a lot. Probably the most effective uh, function of, of an exhibition like, like the beautiful exhibition that, that is happening here is that it whets the appetite or makes one curious. And if the museum or the collection, whether it's a university collection or, or a gallery collection, creates the opportunity to come back and handle the piece later on. You and I were talking earlier about uh, about London, being in London and traveling, and one of the great opportunities that I had when I was in London a few years ago was at uh, the Tate, where in advance we had written a letter to one of the curators, and the curator pulled a whole carousel of William Blake original drawings. So if you know Tiger Tiger, uh, they brought the carol of work into a room, and three of us, I washed my hands, I could handle them. And, and I got to stack the William Blakes one after the other for the three of us to look at. Now, as, as three book artists and three people who valued history, the fact that the tape made that possible, not, not for thousands of people, but if somebody asked, mm -hmm. there was a mechanism that allowed for that intimate relationship. If collections can do that, and today whets the appetite, that's a perfect moment. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, you know, while we were talking, uh, I was looking at, you know, um, for that name I have shorn, well, you, there are parts of it that can't be seen. So when it was at UW, you could only see the front. And then I would tell people if you go around the back, you look around the corner and you can see the back of it, or you can see the sides. But for all the others, actually, they are entities within themselves, so you don't have to open them. I was just interested in the thing, because the whole idea of Book of the Bound is that people's bodies were traded for cloth, and that the books are sealed by cloth. So my work is basically collage, textiles, and enclosing language, sealing it off so you can't see it anyway in that regard. For a letter to the laundress, though, um, a woman named Dr. Maxine Mem said to me that the clothesline was the original text message. Ah. And the thing about the works upstairs is, well, if we recognize that 
a book was forbidden to people who were enslaved. Some, maybe somebody's, you know, a paper, a newsprint or something away, but no books. So that is an open book. It is an unbound book. Um, and I'm still working with this idea of the book form as it relates to um, illiteracy, as it relates to people who are not coming from a book culture. Mm -hmm. And how do th these people understand this relationship? So for me, in terms of exposure, what I find really interesting is that I don't think about where next, what happens next. I think about what is next, what's the next project. Mm -hmm. I need to follow that. Mm -hmm. And somehow, what happens is while I'm in the middle of that or somewhere along that continuum, the opportunity arises. Mm -hmm. And so Letter of the Laundry started out at TK Building in Seattle. It went to King Street Station, Kittredge Gallery, and someone suggested Bema. And I was like, oh no, it's not going to be over to Bema. It doesn't fit over there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I eat crow. <laughs> Unfortunately, time is coming to, to close, and I did ask our artists if they'd be willing to read from one of their works uh, to conclude our panel. So, um, Fred, would you like to, yep. to start? I have to give a short preface. This book is called Returning Home. It's about a man named Shiro Kashino. He was one of the heroes of the Japanese segregated unit, the 442nd, and um, uh, was mistreated by the army, was accused of something that he didn't do, and was court-martialed. He had many, many medals. He should have received the Congressional Medal of Honor, and instead he lost his rank and was court-martialed for a completely unfair way. And then in the decades after the reunions of the 442nd, his friends, who valued his service so much, um, decided to try to get this reversed. And it took decades of working on this. And then they, they hit the final point where they were told no. And then Mrs. Kashina wrote this letter. If this application can be reconsidered and the stigma of a court-martial of dubious circumstances erased, we will be grateful knowing that justice has been served and my husband vindicated. If the application is once again denied, my only consolation will be the fact that he died not knowing that he had lost his last battle. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to read really my written synopsis of Intrusion and a little bit of the colophon from the book. Intrusion is a modern bestiary that illustrates the conjured effects of human encroachment on nature and wildlife. These contemporary beasts are the amalgamation of animal bodies and environmental abuses the illustrated outcomes of the human excesses of plastic bottles and bags, the unrestrained consumption of goods, and the inordinate amount of garbage it creates, the imprudent disposal of decor and furniture, the overuse of water and the naive assumption that water is forever guaranteed, and the evolution of disease that is the consequence of carelessness. We may not be able to change what has been done, but we can act to prevent more deterioration of our environment. The viruses are going to keep growing. The ocean is going to keep coming. They don't care. It's our own lives we save or not. So my preface will be the fact that we've talked about wonderful books all night, and two of us are reading from our cell phones. <laughs> I'm doing, no, I'm doing the exact same thing. I didn't want that to go, I missed, I missed here. Um, so this is the, the introduction to the last uh, image that I showed, a murder of crows or the defense of marriage and other things. A murder of crows, not to be confused with an ostentation of peacocks or a descent of woodpeckers, gathered on the branch of an old chestnut tree. This was their favorite gathering place to debate the issues of the day. The trade pr uh, provided them with prime vantage point from which to spy dinner, being next to a treacherous, curvy country road. They had been gathering here for as long as any could remember. As the wind rustled the leaves, the crows became restless, and this led to reminiscing about creatures that they had eaten. They became wistful 
with gnawing and rumbling nostalgia. <laughs> so I'm going to read um, the poem, Letter to a Laundress. For those of you who have not been upstairs to see the exhibit, the, the poem is on panels of photographs of laundresses and washerwomen from the late 19th century to mid 20th. I am writing this poem to my great, great grandmother who raised my grandmother. And um, it is through the writing, it was through the writing, that I discovered something that perhaps happened, but at least it's revealed itself through here. Letter to a laundress. You taught her well. They say she had the touch. Took wrinkled, soiled shirts. Made them like new, especially collars and cuffs. Her hands mirror yours, lifting, picking, piece by piece apart. Ink, sweat, blood, mud, grass, vomit. What to do with dirty looks, foul language, rank stench, shadowy stains, that remain after all that scrubbing, deftly rubbing, 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 and no way out. Ringer, iron holder, washwoman, leaning in line with lines, untenable lines, whose far reaching consequences found you standing in the path of a past on its way to the future. My line of inquiry, like the lines of this letter, crosses lines never meant to be crossed, only crossed out, <coughs> bleached, faded away in the way blood's unlettered lines meet its deadlines, drawn into silence, the line of her lips. Like you, she was made of all work made to serve, made of service, made to serve the soil. Washing stick, line peg, lie so bluing, sort the sorted, haul that heaviness, never done the work of daughters who keep company with cloth. A dryness fitted to fingers that soak, boil, Scrub, rub, pour, rinse, ring, tightly ring. Wrung out dampness, riveted to iron, pulled over, over, keep pressing, pressing on. Hoist baskets, tote tubs, love those loads. Every bundle extends a line, a line awaiting, a line awaiting its hanging. Lines stretch their length across a yard, beyond which lie the waters, well water, lake water, spring water, creek water. In falling rain, sorrow soaks riversides and creek bed green. Who's there, drenched by despair? Oh, mothers, mothers, blue, blue waters, who hung from those knotted lines. <laughs> Tonight we've been talking about stories and I want to thank each of you for sharing your stories and for bringing us into your world. Your work is truly inspiring and we're so fortunate to have learned from you tonight. I want to thank everybody for attending and again thank you to the museum and Cynthia, but most of all thank you to all of you. Thank you.